Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to have Grammy-nominated violinist Sarah Caswell with me on the Violin Podcast today. Hi, Sarah. Nice to see you. Hey, nice to how's, see you too. How's Brooklyn? <laughs> it's good. It's it's very wet here right now. It's raining. Oh, is it? Like, yeah, the the skies just opened up. So uh, yeah, if you hear a little bit of thunder rumbling in the background, um, yeah, hopefully it won't be too too noticeable. <laughs> no, I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah, but thank you so much for coming uh, for taking the time to speak with me today. We have a lot of cool things to talk about. Um, Fantastic. With your with your career and your new album and you know your history as a violinist because. You know, it's also nice to make a new friend in the violin world. We've never met before, and it's uh, such a pleasure to speak with you. Um, for the for the audience who is not familiar with Sarah Caswell, who is who is Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, no, I, I've uh, I've been playing violin for a long time. Um, I started playing violin when I was about five and a half years old. And um, I started in more of the traditional, uh, down a traditional path as far as uh, violin instruction goes. I began um, learning Suzuki. Uh, this is using Suzuki method as a way of, of getting into violin uh, playing. And um, I have parents who are, are uh, music nerds of sorts. Um, they're both musicologists. And um, so they had oh, a goodness. really, uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. You're the, yeah, first, so... you're the first person on the violin podcast who has both parents, not one, but two parents as musicologists. Wow. So you must be like a huge history buff then. <laughs> well, they certainly were. And it was um, something that, that was, of course, passed on to to both me and my sister, just that love of music and interest in learning about um, music from all, all regions of the world. And so um, pretty early on, uh, my parents thought it would be a, a really cool idea for uh, for both me and my sister to take violin less or take lessons in, um, in other styles of music in addition to Suzuki, just so we had a broader perspective on things. And, you know, keep in mind that this was, um, well, the internet was in its infancy at this point. So, um, you know, easy access to um, different music, musical archives and, and, you know, certainly Spotify, these things weren't in existence. So to, um, to sort of give us exposure to this music, it involved like a day's activity, like going to a music library, checking out records and bringing them home and, and putting them on, um, on our, our uh, stereo. Um, so it was a very valuable uh, thing for us to be um, listening to these records and recordings and getting a broader perspective on the musical world. Um, so I started doing, um, taking uh, Baroque violin lessons uh, when I was around eight or nine, and um, also started taking jazz uh, jazz lessons at that same time. So I was doing three different um, three different tracks of lessons. Uh, but for me, it was it was all fun. You know, it was um, it wasn't like a segregated thing where I'm doing classical and jazz. And, and Baroque. Um, for me, it was all music, and I was really able to get uh, an understanding about how, how those those styles of music interlaced, and um, how this there were, of course, many more similarities than there were differences. Um, so I, you know, started doing those three different kinds of um, musical studies, and really sort of. Um, uh, Kind of as time went on, I really felt that classical and um, jazz were a little bit more uh, me. Um, so I started doing, um, spending more time studying that and started doing classical competitions and was playing in my high school jazz band and was uh, you know, doing a lot of um, things along, along those lines. Um, and when I got to college, I, st I studied both styles of music. And, um, and then toward the end of my college, I was really sort of, uh, college time I felt um, as though my, my true self was uh, a little more in the jazz arena. And so um, once I finished my undergraduate degrees, I took a little bit of time off from school, was teaching and, and performing and traveling. Um, and then I finally decided in the fall of 2004 to, uh, to move to New York to pursue a, a master's degree in jazz performance. And um, yeah, I kind of made that a long answer to your question. No, but, this um, is wonderful. Yeah, and I was, I was reading a little bit more about what you, um, where you studied and you studied uh, at Indiana. Uh, mm -hmm. from your undergrad and you, am I correct that you studied with Gingold and Joseph Gingold? I did. Yeah, yeah my professor studied uh, with Joseph Gingold. Maybe you might know him. Richter Norin. Do you happen oh. to know the name? No, do you do you know when he was there? I, I'm afraid not. No, but okay. he's um, but no, it was uh, it's nice to have that Gingold connection. I mean, of course, yeah. I never took lessons with him, but I hear just many great things about his, you know, pedagogy and his style of teaching and 
Yeah, he was he was such an incredible teacher. I mean, all the teachers that I had um, during my my studies at IU were amazing. So I, I grew up in Bloomington, which is where um, Indiana University is located. Right. Yes. So I kind of grew up in that um, in that college town, and and was certainly around the music school a lot since my father was a, a musicology professor there. So Mimi Zweig, who started the um, the IU pre college program, um, she and Rebecca Henry, who um, now is at Peabody, I believe, um, but she and uh, Rebecca and Mimi were my first teachers. And, um, you know, they were just a phenomenal uh, pair um, as far as like first teachers go. And, and I re- learned so much from them. And and then after I studied with Mimi for about five years, I, I began working with uh, Joseph Gingold. And oh, my God, what a, an incredible period of time that was to to learn from such a master, um, a master performer, a master teacher um, and just such a beautiful human being, um, just so giving and so loving, uh, you know, if, and had such a passion for the music. Um, when he passed, I was about, oh, maybe 16 years old when he passed away. Um, I then went on to study with one of his former students, Henry Kowalski. And um, Henry was was another amazing teacher. And of course, coming from that lineage of, of Gingold, um, we shared a, a, that kind of connection. And was uh, he was really able to, to um, just... Uh, yeah, just give me so much more to learn and um, so many ways to, to grow. And then, of course, my studies with David Baker, who is also at IU. Um, he was a phenomenal jazz um, trombonist, cellist, and um, and uh, a pedagogue. And um, yeah, I, I just I couldn't have asked for a better set of, of teachers during my time there in Bloomington. That's really fantastic. Yeah, it's so I can hear the passion in your voice, how they really <laughs> made a, an impact on your life and your musical life. Um, but you're now more involved in the in the jazz world, as you as you said just a moment ago. And I was listening to your your previous records and your new record. And, you know, the one with nine horses, your previous record is very different than Omega, which is, you know, by the time this podcast episode is out is already available either for pre order or it's available for all online platforms. But I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about your recording process into jazz because there is a little bit of improvisation involved. Some of it is already, you know, you have the charts, you know the chord progression. Can you talk to us a bit about that recording process as you, or actually, let's actually take a step back. I would love for us to talk about the moment you want to create an album and then you go from there. (laughs) Yeah. Well, um, just to clarify for your listeners. Um, so I, um, as a jazz musician, I'm part of many, many groups. And, um, that's one of the joys of, of, uh, sort of being a jazz balance is that different leaders have different, um, instrumental visions and different sounds that they go for. Um, so I have a group that I lead. Um, it's a, it's a quartet of my own. Um, the group that we're talking about right now, this is called nine horses. And, um, this is, uh, the core of the group is a trio. Um, and it's, uh, with me on violin and Hardinger de Amore, uh, Andrew Ryan on bass. And our band leader is, um, Joseph Brent. He is, um, the mandolinist and, uh, also the composer of most of these selections. Um, so yeah, this group I've been part of for, oh goodness, maybe about, uh, maybe about seven years or so. Um, and it's been just a phenomenal group. So, and what's unique about this group in particular, um, as opposed to, um, some of the other groups that I do, which are a little bit more straightforward, um, in, as far as the jazz stylings go, um, Nine Horses is unique in that Joe, um, has really taken the time to blend our, our individual backgrounds together in the music that he, he composes. So uh, for me, in that case, that translates into um, you know, my jazz background, my classical background, um, and then also a little bit of Americana. I mean, I've, I've had a, a lot of exposure to different styles of music. I, I say my, my primary specialties are in classical and jazz, but um, I've had a lot of exposure to some other stuff too. So he's kind of woven that into the compositions that he does. And um, Andrew, is kind of in a similar situation. He um, has a lot of classical background to his playing, um, but he's also got um, much more of an Americana um, sensibility to his uh, his um, you know performance as well. So, and Joe's background uh, is in um, he, he actually played violin for quite a while. So he's a violinist, but he's primarily a mandolin player now. Um, but he's done a lot with classical music. He's a phenomenal. Um, 
classical uh, mandolinist, a great jazz player, um, has done a lot with rock music um, and, and folk music as well. So as you can see, like we have um, a lot of similar backgrounds, but we also have a, like, unique qualities um, with our upbringing as well. So Joe's been able to write all of that into the sound that you hear. Um, so as you were saying, there are elements of um, classical, there are elements of, of jazz, there are elements of improvisation that kind of belonged um, in all in both those different styles and of course Americana too. So it's been really fun. Um, so going back to your question as far as um, you want to record an album, <laughs> um, you know, with, with this group in particular, uh, the recording process and the album development um, was very unique. Um, and I say unique in that, like, like for instance, when I record my own album, um, I, you know, I've been working in a batch of repertoire for a while, and um, once I really feel like the album is kind of t like the repertoire has taken form, um, and I have my album's worth of material, then I call up the band, we rehearse, and we block off two days of, of recording time, and we go into the studio for two full days and we record, and that's that's the yeah, that's the process, more or less. Um, this album didn't come together in that way. Um, uh, as far as Joe's composition process, um, you know, he he started writing this project, I think, like five years ago. Um, wow, sort of yeah. piecing to piecing together these different uh, songs that he was and melodies that he was hearing in his head, and sort of formulating those into these um, these compositions that he um, that you hear on the album, and. Um, because of the fact that he was hearing this uh, this project in a much bigger way, and what I mean by that is that it wasn't just the three of us, like you, you heard on our first album, which was Perfect as Harold. That was just really the the three core members, you know, bass, violin, and, and um, a mandolin. Which is, by the way, like you, you like you went on a road, and all of a sudden you take a massive detour to that original <laughs> sound in Omega. I was actually quite shocked. Like I, I before I, I heard Omega, I was like listening to the. To the the previous album with just the three of you and I go wait am I listening wait am I listening to the right thing <laughs> so that's what I was saying that yeah that album was very much an acoustic thing and we actually approached that album that recording of that album in the way that I was speaking about with my own project where like you know we're like we go into the studio for two or three days and we like we record that's it um so this was very different so you know he, Joe had a, a sense of how the three of us would fit into this kind of sonic landscape, but there were also many other voices, many other people that he heard being involved with these, this project. Um, to the extent, like I think it would it would have been an impossibility to get all of these people into, um, into the studio at one time. And I think also just um, uh, it's, it, schedule wise, it would have been a nightmare to try to coordinate. But I think also the way in which this was done, it's not something where you just get into a studio and do it. Um, there are a lot of layers. There are a lot of um, uh, um, a lot of uh, how do I say this? Um, things that are sh shaped and crafted in a way that you you know it takes time to do, and you couldn't do it within a two hour window of of time. Um, so yeah, so this project has kind of been pieced together over the course of um, a you know, couple of years at least, um, not including the pandemic. Now the pandemic certainly um, caused a lot of <laughs> caused a lot of complications, um, but in a lot of ways it also added it, it created some opportunities as well. I think we got the bulk of the tracks recorded, um, you know, in this piecemeal way. Uh, whatever involved some studio time, we were able to get done before the pandemic. I think our last recording session happened in February uh, of 2020. 20, yeah. And then the shutdown happened. Um, and that was when Joe, <clears throat> he is a, a phenomenal uh, audio engineer as well. So he was able to um, communicate and uh engineer a lot of these tracks from home, you know, getting people to visit um, the various guests that we have on the album, having them record their parts at home. And then he would uh, take those parts and put them into um, Pro Tools and able to, was, was able to sort of push, uh, put all these pieces together. It's so, so interesting that you talk about the recording engineer because oftentimes they get overlooked. You know, they, like, they look at the people on the albums like, oh yeah, they recorded, that's their sound. But as a matter of fact, the sound design, the actual engineering of where they place the mics, that's an art in and of, a, in and of itself to get that specific sound that you're going for in Omega, which is, it was really, really Absolutely. a pleasure to listen to. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, Joe, you know, I think in a lot of ways, I mean, it's, it, we're so lucky that Joe has such an ear and uh, such a uh, skill with Pro Tools and mixing and all of this. Um, because, yeah, I mean, he knows how he wants these pieces to sound, you know, and, and who better in a way that to do that than the, the composer? You know, I mean, it's, I would imagine it's very difficult for a composer when they're in the studio trying to, you know, I mean, that's why you, you hire an engineer who you know can realize the vision that you have. Um, but it's great when you're, as the composer, you're actually able to do that yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, Joe was able to do that. And really, um, I mean, of, of course, he sought advice from um, from master mixers and engineers um, along the way just to, you know, make sure that, he, that um, you know, just as a, you know, as a sounding board for a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, when listening to the entire p um, project, um, once he'd finished doing all of the mixing and mastering, um, it it was really uh, pretty incredible what he was able to do. Yeah, like the first track of the entire album, it was like this, um, it was like this really dark sound. I was not expecting it, and I'm like, Nine Horses. Why? Why name the band Nine Horses? <laughs> is is like there's got to be some kind of Nordic mythology maybe involved with the sound and the name? And I was wondering if you could just talk about Nine Horses as like what the what the name of the band actually means. Because it's just right. the three of you, I'm like that. That doesn't make sense. So I'm curious to know your thoughts. <laughs> I know that's that's probably one of the questions we get asked the most when we're doing um, doing uh, workshops with with uh, you know students um, is where the name comes from. So it's actually uh, the title of a Billy Collins poem. Oh, and, um, I was totally wrong then. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, that's usually people are like, well, where are the other, other you know, other uh, six horses? You know, like what's going on there? Um, no, it's a Billy Collins poem. And um, it was a, I, I don't have the poem in front of me, but it, um, it's a, uh, the poem is, is sort of a, a, a narration about this gift that Billy receives from his wife. And it's this um, image of nine horses, um, or, or nine horses heads, um, and just sort of the, his feelings about that. And I think the, the emotion and the, um, the emotion and the motion uh, that was kind of in this, poem was something that really um, connect, like really connected with Joe. And he felt that um, sort of that musical energy um, was something that, or it was that energy was something we could translate into a musical fashion. Um, and that's where the, the name comes from, so. That's so fascinating. I And I actually wanna talk about the actual music of the album. So I think, how many tracks are there on the album? Were there nine? I can't remember off the top oh, of my head. Oh, goodness, um, that's a good question. But anyway, uh, I do want yeah. to talk about the actual music. Like, what was your take on actually receiving the sheet music, or you know, the when you were pitched the sounds of this of this idea? What was going through your head? What was like? Did you like it at first? Did you not like it? Was it exciting? <laughs> was it not? You know, and you know, Joel, if you're listening, you're that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, no, I... I'll bet her off. It's okay. <laughs> No, I I absolutely adore Joe's compositions. Um, I I have a you know having worked with him for this long, um, I have a good sense of well, we we all as a trio certainly have a very good sense of of the process now, uh, and that is that Joe will um, will put his ideas on on paper, um, but they are not set in stone. Um, and he definitely, I mean, he's writing for us. He's writing for our voices. So he tr he wants us to get in there and, and get our hands dirty as far as um, sort of uh, working the piece and, and really um, crafting it to another level. Um, and we're not, we're not, of course, rewriting it. We're just, we're um, adjusting things here and there to um, to really uh, make the piece come to, come off the page and come to life. Um, but yeah, I mean, Joe's pieces, they're not easy. <laughs> they take a lot of work. Um, um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm sure to ask, like, when he says, all right, I've got another piece written, we're going to get together for a rehearsal here in a couple of weeks. I'm like, all right, send me the music ASAP, because I know I'll have to, to study it and practice it. But it's such a joy, because I, I know that when we actually get our, our voices together, it's going to be, um, it's going to be pretty, pretty fun and uh, an epic journey. Um, and I, I love that challenge that he, um, he uh, puts in front of us. And I love the, the process of, um, of crafting these pieces with him as a group. I was um, listening, I was listening to your violin playing in this album. And I go, wow, this does sound challenging. But my God, that must have been so fun. To oh, record. Yeah. oh, my goodness, you're like all over the place. And, you know, and I and for all the listeners who are like interested in this album, I highly, 
highly recommend it. It's a lot of interesting sounds you haven't heard before. I will guarantee that. And it'll, <laughs> it'll make you. And what was cool about this album is that you're you're wanting more. Like your your ear is engaged, and I think that's what's so special about the the sounds, the collective sounds that、um, were you know being produced in in this album. Yeah, it's well, and you know, there's a so the acoustic trio is kind of at the core, like I had mentioned before. But the way that、sure. Joe was able to layer everybody's contributions in and was able to manipulate the sounds, like as you heard、um, at various points throughout the album,、um, he goes in there and he takes the violin and he puts all kinds of different filters on it and manipulates it in such a way that it's like, oh my god, is that me? Like, kind of, you know, it's like, did I record that? But he's able to do it in such a beautiful, masterful way that、um, it really does become sort of like the cinematic. Landscape of sound, and I,、um, yes. I love, I love the way that he's able, he did that, you know, in, in his engineering and, and composing of this project. I was just gonna say it sounded cinematic, which was, which also leads back the question like, is this music approachable? Is this album approachable? And I would say it's very much approachable. And you know, for someone who has not heard this kind of music before, you could listen to this album and you'd be like, wow, this has made an impression on me.、And、I think that's what struck me the most is like anybody. Who likes anything? You know, has has elements of rock and folk, Americana, jazz, classical. I was really impressed with the with the the Max Richter、uh, <laughs> inspiration, and I'm a huge Max Richter fan. And、um, I actually got to see him live when I, in in Massachusetts, where I'm currently based right now. But yeah. it was,、uh, yeah, like the the minimalistic ideology in that in that piece. I want to I want to figure out what your favorite piece is. Um, and I know it's a、oh, tough call, but if you had、is. to maybe like top three ish, I know I'm I'm looking through my book right now of the pieces that we've done because I I need like a visual reminder of them.、Um, mm-hmm. I think the water understands is one that I particularly love.、Um, we did a video of that one as well,、um, cool. pre-pandemic, and、uh, that was one of the first ones that we did where it was a performance involving more than、um, uh, just. Three of us. So that was involving Nate Cosey,、um, Kevin Garcia,、um, and、uh, oh, the engineer. The engineer's、uh, name is escaping me right now.、Um, but it was it was just a really、uh, a fun、um, venture into that sort of performance aspect of of our of our group.、Um, so that one I love.、Um, oh, I you know I, yeah, it's really hard to choose. You know, I love. They're also interesting. I kind of put you on the spot there, but they're. I know. No, it's good though. Great,、um, but I'm one. I'm wondering, like, with this kind of jazz training, <laughs> that you know, you're 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 on faculty at the Berkeley College of Music, and you know, when you're teach, I mean, you're currently doing it. You're you're in the field. You're recording. You're promoting albums. And can you give the the, the violin students on the violin podcast who are listening in, you know, what?、Um, What does it take to become like a a full time pro musician? Because I'm I'm curious to have the the listeners know your perspective. Yeah,、um, you have to have a passion for this music. That that's number one. Like a passion for making music, a love for、um, exploration, and um, um, and just、uh, you know. The idea of what it is to、um, emotionally communicate、um, through through your instrument, that has to be something that you are are so passionate about.、Um, for me, I I know I couldn't. There's nothing else in the world I would much I would rather do than make music.、Um, and I've known that since I was a kid. Like the minute that I picked up the instrument,、um, I I felt a connection to that. Fiddle that I'd never felt with anything else, you know, and I really felt as soon as I had it in my hand, I was like, "Oh my God, this this feels like a part of me," and that's been、um, a constant in my life,、um, because of the fact that I feel as though I there's nothing else that I really I I could do.、Um, that's determine all the choices that I've made.、Um, being a musician isn't necessarily the easiest thing, but It's some I would never I don't there's nothing else I would want to be doing, and、um, I love you know I love traveling I love performing I love、um, the collaborative process,、um, it's it just is so fulfilling and、um, you know there's no prescribed way of like how to to get to a level of sustainability with with this you know with a profession and there's no like、um, uh, I'd say、uh, 
idyllic career. I think everybody has their own unique picture of what it is to be a musician and what it is that's fulfilling to them. And I think it's, you know, it's each of our, our responsibilities to figure out what we want to be doing with our music careers and how we get there. Um, yeah, I wish that there was like some sort of, you know, manual for violin for making or violin magic pill. Exactly. There's no yeah. magic pill, right? No. And no. It was. It's a very interesting conversation. I have many of these conversations on the Violin Podcast because it's nice to know every person's perspective. But what it comes down to is that there's no there's no magic pill. It's either mm -mm. either you put into work for something that you truly love, you go all in, or you don't. And I think that's what I'm taking out of this conversation right now. And the reason why I mentioned that you're a faculty because you you teach this stuff. You know, you're in the profession. You teach this stuff. Do you teach privately or do you teach like specific courses or classes? Um, regarding like, I don't know, music entrepreneurship or jazz violin studies, wh what exactly do you do in, um, as a teacher? So I primarily teach private. Um, so I've got, uh, most of my private students are through uh, the Berklee College of Music, but I'm also on faculty at Manhattan School of Music mm -hmm. and, um, and New School, the New School. And then I have a few private students that I see as well. Uh, so um, yeah, I don't teach uh, any ensembles at this point. Um, the, the private lesson and like that instruction gives me a flexibility to keep doing you know tours and, and performances and that sort of thing um but you know the as far as uh you know i'm not though i'm not teaching an entrepreneur class or or anything like that of course those topics come in to you know come up in the lessons that i give um and i'm there to be a sounding board i'm there to give some guidance you know to my students whether it be with certain technical things musical things or professional things you know i i love to to share the experiences that i've had with my students at that can be something of benefit to them. And um, you know, for me, it's all kind of intertwined. You know, the idea of being a performer, a teacher, um, a composer, like all those things just kind of make up what it is for me to be a musician. And um, whatever I can do to, you know, to help my students out along their personal journey is something that I really find fulfilling. So essentially, you're a walking business. <laughs> I suppose <laughs> you're a walking business. You're an ad. You're an ad. You're an advertisement. You're a, you're a business. You're a musician. You're a marketer. You're everything, which is uh, super impressive for me because I felt like you know when I did my studies in Boston and you know I went to U UMass Amherst for my grad school, I've always felt that you know I was. I, like three years of my undergrad, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be an orchestral musician. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to play Brahms symphonies for the best rest of my life. And that is going to be awesome. However, I took an audition, decided it was not for me. And then I became more entrepreneurial. But I feel like that is such a, a unique skill set that can be taught. You know, every everyone has that ability to learn you know, to play well, right? You know, learning, learning a violin is a skill that you can learn. And then being a good business person is also something that you can learn. And yeah. uh, that's something that I'm pretty passionate about too, you know, the music business side of things and how you can provide good music, but also receive, um, you know, financial benefits and, you know, et cetera. So, yeah, no, I think that's what being a professional musician is about. I mean, it's not just, if, if it were just about the music making, then, um, yeah, the, all the training that we've been doing since we were kids is, is all we would need, but that's not how the music business works. You know, it's, yes, obviously we have to have our skills as a, as a musician and a performer, but we also have to have our, our, our skills as a teacher. We also have to have our skills as, um, as an entrepreneur, as you said, like, you know, how do we get our music out to people so that they can hear it and enjoy it? How do we put tours together? How do we sort of, um, make what we do financially viable? And, um, it's, it's a complicated process. And I, I think in a lot of ways, this wasn't something that was taught to musicians before, like in prior uh, generations, this was something like you, you handed this responsibility off to a manager or whoever, or record label at that time when when record labels were actually really a viable way of, of having a career sustain itself. Um, that was somebody else's responsibility, but that's not how it works these days. I mean, as you know, like everyone's kind of their own CEO of their own musical company, and um, you know we are responsible for being our our own agent and our own booker and our our own promoter. Um, and you know, I, I think at some point, you know, you you are at a, a place in your career where you can hire people to help you out with these sorts of things. But I think what I've found in, in conversations with, with friends is that at least we've all, like wherever we are in our musical ventures, we've all at least had quite a bit of experience being our own 
advocates when it comes to um, making our, our careers sustainable. Um, so it's a lot of hats to wear, um, but you know, at the, when it comes down to it, it's all built around this passion that we have for making music. And um, yeah, I mean, there are days, of course, when I get frustrated having to, to spend the entire day booking flights for you know, the band or having to deal with contracts and all that. But then I, I step back and I remember all of that business is centered around what I can't wait to do, which is to get on a stage and to play with these musicians and perform with an audience. That's the most high and, and like the most joy that I can get. And it makes everything else that I do that it maybe isn't quite as fun, makes it worth it. That's so cool. Well, I know you're, you have such a passion for music. I love like listening to you talking, such an advocate for music in general, like jazz music and everything. But I want to take a detour and do and talk about things outside of music. What are your passions? What are your hobbies? You know, what do you do if let's say, oh, these jazz skills are <laughs> me up and I want to do something besides touch my instrument? Because the reality is, is that we, you know, we also musicians take breaks from our instrument. It's nice to get a healthy perspective away from the instrument. So I'm curious to know, like, are there any things that you're passionate about outside of violin? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, the music is richer because of the experiences you have in life. The, the life that you live comes through into your music. So <clears throat> I'm uh, I'm definitely one who loves to live life. And um, yeah, I have a lot of different things that I enjoy doing. Um, I'm a runner, so I like to go out and, you know, run uh, you know, I've, I've run marathons before. I'm not great at them. So my, um, my oh, preference still is... kudos to you. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I, uh, I do, I do enjoy running. And that's one of the things that really kind of recharges me when I'm, I'm a little, getting, you know, in a frustrated zone or, or, um, just need a break from things. Um, I also love bicycling, long distance cycling. That's another thing. I, I did a lot of that when I was living in Indiana. Um, if, if good. you say if you're a swimmer too, then I'm just going to consider a triathlete. No, no, I, I, <laughs> no, I'm not a big swimmer. <laughs> so, so, yeah, not not my. Not there's, my this, there's this also this huge uh, tri triathlon, like the Ironman. Is oh that... yeah. Yeah, I was I've gonna say like, are you? It. I was gonna I was gonna be prepared to be like, oh yeah, you're like an Ironman competitor. Okay. No, <laughs> nope, nope, <Okay. laughs> not gonna happen. Um, so yeah, so as far as like physical activities that I do, I really enjoy that and hiking as well. Um, as far as yeah, other activities that I enjoy doing. Um, so well, one of the two new hobbies actually that kind of uh, emerged during the pandemic. Um, you know, I wasn't touring; I was I was home. You know, as we all were, uh, just sort of um, riding the crazy wave that COVID was. And um, so one of the things that got started was um, baking. So I, I did a, a, a uh, Sunday stress bake um, one day in like the Sunday in March Ooh. and um, can I join can I join next time <laughs> <laughs> absolutely so I mean I was just I, I posted this photograph of, of something that I, I baked and and the positivity that came out of that uh, that bake I was like well maybe I should just keep doing this so I I just actually had to break the streak I had a 69 week uh, baking Sunday baking streak going wow so that's from... like an over a year of baking Yes, uh, wow. 69 weeks of, of Sunday stress baking. But I, I had to quit it this last Sunday because I was in Europe um, on t doing a tour uh, for a week. So I, I had to had oh, to stop goodness. the baking. But that was, you know, I never really baked much in my life. My mom did a lot of baking when I was a kid, but I, I didn't really do much of it on my own. So this was sort of a fun venture for me to do. And um, yeah, it was a lot of a lot of uh, fun, tasty treats to, to, to explore. Another cool. hobby. Yeah. Another hobby that came out of all this was, um, pottery. Uh, there was a, a pottery studio, um, close by my apartment and, um, I'd always wanted to take a pottery class. My mom had done it when she was, um, my age, um, just, you know, kind of as a fun hobby. Um, so I'd always love to do it and I'd always wanted to take a class, but, you know, as a musician, the idea of, you know, I couldn't sign up for like a six week course because I was, there was at least going to be like two or three days when I wouldn't be able to attend the class. Um, uh, so with the pandemic, I was here the entire time. So I took four different classes through this, um, this studio. And now I have a membership there and uh, I've been loving throwing pots. And, you know, it's a very musical activity, uh, that little lyricism that you find in, in, th pulling up the walls and, and finding the shapes that um, the clay wants to be molded into. Um, yeah, it's a really, um, a very meditative, uh, cathartic thing for me to be doing. I'm, I'm, so, I'm hoping to still doing them both. Yeah, I'm noticing that all these activities are, you know, you use your hands 
a lot. You know, pottery, baking, yeah. violin. You're, you, it seems like you're the kind of person that likes to be like, get, be creative with your hands. Like if my fingers and hands are not doing anything, then it's like, ah, like you're, not, you're not living. So I feel the same way for sure. I, I think it was, you know, the violin podcast was something for me. Like, it's just like, it's just kind of like a random idea. Like, oh, there is no such thing as violin podcast. I should create one. And then, <laughs> and then there it is. Right. Yep. Um, but we're just, we're approaching the end of our time, Sarah. So one, one last question before I let you go. And uh, I really, really had fun during this conversation, but there are a Likewise. lot of, there are a lot of students who are approaching music school or someone who is kind of nervous. They want to start something new. They want to start playing the violin and uh, they're not sure if it's for them, whether they're an adult beginner, whether they're, you know, a parent listening to the violin podcast could be anyone. What could you say to that person who's listening right now? Who is like, I'm, I'm on the fence. Should I try getting a music career or, you know, should I even start playing music? What, what can you say to them? If you love it, pursue it. That's my, my feeling about it. I, you know, I don't, yeah, I, I never went into the, like into my violin degrees thinking, you know, uh, can I make this career work? Um, I just, I knew I loved it. I knew I had to do it and, and pursue my passion and, and I wanted to learn more. And I felt like that passion would lead to something. And I just had to have faith that um, that that passion I have for the music will will lead to good things and lead to me actually being able to make a career out of doing it. Um, if yeah, if you love it, then pursue it. You know, um, I think you know yeah the the idea that uh, faith in hand in what ends up happening with your with your life. You know, just have faith in in a passion driven life. And, um, and don't worry so much about the details because you never know where life is going to lead. You know, I, I had no idea when I was six or seven years old that, um, I, that you know, 30 some years later, I would be, you know, living in Brooklyn and um, you know, talking with you and, and having just gotten back from Europe and you know, releasing these albums and, you know, having a, you know, a Grammy nomination. I never knew any of this was going to happen. All I knew is that I, I loved music and I wanted to to study it and learn as much as I could about it. And that's still the venture that I'm on. You know, I, I still transcribe. I'm still practicing every day and, and um, you know, just working on, on improving skills. You know, I, there's always more to learn. And um, when that's sort of the motivator in your life, then you never know where the path is, that path is going to lead. So, you know, just have faith in, in your passion and good things will come out of that. Sarah, thanks so much for coming on the Violin Podcast. Really, really appreciate this conversation. And uh, for any listener who's new to us or a returning uh, listener, please make sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification, so that way you get notified for when these new episodes come out. We know season two is underway. So please make sure to follow us on all social media platforms. Make sure you know you like us on your favorite podcast platform. And uh, until next time, Sarah, I wish I can see you in person and meet you in person. And uh, that would be, uh, that would be uh, a wonderful time. And I, I, I need Likewise. to learn like a, a, a baking recipe from you. Or just some baking. <laughs> Gladly. So. <laughs> I'll send you over some. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Until next time.